I normally put spoiler warnings in the description, but this game in particular warrants an additional note because of how story focused it is. If you haven't played Firewatch and you like narrative driven games, I strongly recommend you play it before watching this video. I genuinely believe it is one of the most thoughtful and creative pieces of video game storytelling that I've ever played. After spending two months of my life grappling with Skyrim and its narrative pitfalls, a strangely glorious game whose reach perennially exceeds its grasp, moving to the short, meticulous four-hour experience of Firewatch felt like, well, it felt like a nice break. I had played Firewatch years ago, back when it first came out, and I haven't really been able to shut up about it ever since. So this video is the ultimate consequence of that. Absolutely nobody asked for this, but my therapist said I need to get better about doing things for me. Or they probably would if I could afford therapy. I, I, I don't have very good health care. Firewatch's prologue is rich but efficient in how quickly and effectively it plants us in Henry's deeply flawed boots. I'm going to be going through this prologue pretty much beat for beat because of how crucial it is to the rest of Firewatch's story. We play out the meeting of Henry and Julia before getting our first snippet of gameplay. Henry's descent in an elevator down to the dark of a parking garage where his lovably ugly truck awaits. Henry tosses his pack into the bed of the truck and we move back in time to their honeymoon phase. They're together, they move in, they drink beers, life is good, all present tense. As players, we're experiencing this for the first time, and the use of present tense makes it feel like Henry is too, even though he's also already packed his bag to leave. They get a dog. A few years later, Julia asks about kids. Henry answers. They get engaged, lying in bed on a Sunday morning. Henry arrives at the thoroughfare trailhead. A fire danger sign nearby is set to extreme. He starts up the path, and now it's 1980. Julia is four hours late. Henry is worried and angry, and when she finally gets home, he can either get mad or ignore her. He's in a sun-drenched forest now, the pines reduced to silhouettes by a sunset so intense it borders on the wrathful. It's also 1982. They're walking their dog, and they have an encounter with a mugger. Then it's 1984. Work gets in the way of their plans to have kids. Julia is offered a job at Yale. Henry can convince her not to take it or can ask her to commute. These two choices here foreshadow the much darker ones that are coming. At this point, Henry can't make the selfless decision. His academic wife was just offered a job at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, and he isn't willing to move their life there for that opportunity. Instead, Henry talks her out of it or makes her plan around him. In 1985, Julia's mental health problems appear for the first time in their relationship. Henry can encourage her to talk to someone or just make macaroni and drink wine and try to forget about it. It's early onset dementia. She's 41. Henry's in a dark forest, a weary dusk fading on the horizon. He opens a journal, Julia's journal. Inside is her sketch of Henry and, if you look fast enough, a note at the bottom of the other page, a reminder to call her sister because she's been forgetting for three weeks. Hopefully now that I've written it down, I've got no excuse but to check in. It's 1987 and her affliction is getting worse. She's sent home on permanent medical leave. We have fewer choices now. As players, we just have to accept the deteriorating situation in the same way that Henry does. In 1988, Henry has to choose between moving her into a full-time care facility or taking care of her by himself. The night passes and he's in a forest of lush greens, walking on a rough trail cut into a cluster of aspen trees. He sees an elk on the path ahead and it stares him down, noble, dignified. Then he's back with Julia and everything is hard. The contrast of this moment with the simplicity of the woods and the elegance of the elk couldn't be starker. Julia needs help with everything. Henry gets mad at her when she tries to cook her own food. He's exhausted and starts going out when she's sleeping. The choice to either put a chair in front of the bedroom door or just hope and pray that she stays asleep is such a gut-wrenching detail. Those nights where he gets a little escape understandably mean a lot to Henry. In 1989, he stopped at a DUI checkpoint, blows a .10, and goes to jail for the night. Julia's parents find out and come to visit. The house is a mess because of course it is, and they take Julia back to Australia. Henry isn't in any position to argue. Whether or not he wanted that space, it's clear that he needs it. A few weeks go by, and an ad in the paper catches his eye. 
This introduction is so brilliant at making us feel like Henry and, by making us choose between so many flawed, imperfect options, making us feel responsible for the emotional wreckage in which Henry and Julia find themselves. There's so much about it I adore, the mixture of nostalgia and grief from living these tiny, important moments while simultaneously running from their ultimate consequences years in the future. Having the player continue to press a button to advance time is a great touch. We have to literally accept Julia's declining health in the same way that Henry has to. Then there's the brilliant use of liminal spaces to tie it all together. The elevator, the trailhead, the small campground in the dark, the trail closer to the lookout. This entire prologue puts Henry between worlds in every sense of the word, bouncing back between the now of his summer and the now of his relationship with Julia, torn between his need to escape and his obligation to the woman he loves. I think if this prologue works for you and you can connect with this wretched alchemy of love, duty, fear, and grief, then I think Firewatch rewards you with a thoughtful human story about the strength it takes to stop running from difficult things. If you don't find this opening that effective, I think Firewatch is reduced to a pretty game with snappy dialogue and an underwhelming ending. If you couldn't tell already, I fall in the former camp. I love this game. That's a lot of pressure to place on the first 10 minutes in the game, but it has to happen here because once we're in the woods, we mostly get to control what Henry says, if anything, including what he says to Delilah about Julia. It will come up after a dream, but Henry can avoid discussing more about it. If you do, it can change what Delilah says to Henry at the end of the game. Avoiding talking about Julia wouldn't mean that Henry's not still thinking about her, but it would mean that the player might not be, in which case the story doesn't really work as well. Another game that frontloads this emotional core is The Witcher 3, whose already shaky main quest falls apart if the player doesn't come to care about Ciri. Players that haven't read the books have to either bond with her in that brief opening, or at least accept Geralt's intense paternal bond with her for the rest of the main quest to function. I bring this up for two reasons. The first to show that Firewatch is an aberrant in this respect, and the second because as a video games essayist, I'm legally required to reference The Witcher 3 at least three times a year or the bad men return. <laughs> The visual of the tower after we arrive is striking, backlit by an enormous moon with the door to the tower blinking red every few seconds from a light inside. There's something quietly ominous about it, this glowing red doorway. I began my analysis of this first act with the famed opening lines from Dante's Inferno. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark for the straightforward pathway had been lost. It's hard to not play Firewatch without considering all the hellish connections. We have our dark woods before the doorway, we have the fire, the smoke, the ash, the fear, and we have, of course, the sinners. It's a reading that fits the text remarkably well, especially if you choose to read Delilah's departure at the end of the game as betrayal. Betrayal being the deepest circle of hell in Dante's poem. Through this lens, the game could become an exploration of the subtle hells we make for ourselves as a consequence of our indecisions. I'm not sure this is my preferred reading though, mostly because if we were to go in that direction, I think this is much more of a purgatory than a hell for Henry and Delilah, and one could argue that that's the case for Ned as well. I also don't view Delilah's actions at the game's conclusion that uncharitably, but we'll touch on that more when we get there. Speaking of that particular devil, we climb the tower and meet her, and if she sounds a touch drunk and a touch lonely, it's because we'll soon confirm that she is. So what's wrong with you? Excuse me? People take this job to get away from something, so what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Our first conversation in the game and Firewatch builds it around this idea of flight, of escape. It's playful and odd, but it's front and center in our minds as we smash to the title card. Welcome to the job. Day one opens with Henry on the typewriter, his wedding ring on his finger, and the picture of Julia turned up on his desk. We'll be tracking both those items moving forward. His photograph of Julia is also on the opposite side of the desk to his pine cone and Wyoming postcard, really emphasizing that separation. Delilah's first day orientation is disrupted by fireworks going off near Henry's tower, and we're sent down to stop them. This is our first quest, as it were, and I like that Henry's response to it is panic and uncertainty. It continues that characterization of Henry as a flawed, middle-aged man who believes he's trying his best rather than Henry, video game protagonist who's ready for anything. So we're off to the lake to stop them. Somehow, we don't really know. There's more playful banter between Henry and Delilah here, but today it's much more two-sided. 
I can't spend too much time talking about these conversational pieces because this video would be six hours long, and while that may be super serving my P1s, it would be a Herculean edit, and with Starfield coming out in a few weeks, I'm doing my best to avoid tasks of Herculean or Sisyphean or really any kind of moderately exerting nature that may invoke a Greek fellow. Henry gives the young women down by the lake a talking to, and then it's time to head back to our tower. I also circled back to clean up all the beer cans. I love that it's totally optional and we're never prompted to do it. We just can. There's no gameplay consequence for not picking up the cans. Delilah won't know, but in this first act especially, there's a lot of beer cans and a Henry that stops to pick them all up is a pretty different character to a Henry that doesn't. It's such a small thing, but Firewatch is a game about these small things. Here's some words that feel weird to say together. These beer cans, this question of to grab or not to grab when there's no immediate consequence, is foreshadowing for the biggest decision Henry will make in this game. With that settled, we chart a new path towards our tower. Playful banter abounds, but what I appreciate about Delilah is even though her professionalism is unorthodox at the best of times and non-existent at the worst, she clearly cares about both the job and her charges. You can hear it in her voice, how quickly she responds to the fireworks, how she checks in on Henry, how she reacts to hearing the storm on our walk back. Well, that's bad, right? Because of the lightning? It just means we'll be busy. Hurry home and try not to get hit by lightning. And then, depending on your taste and humor, we have one of Firewatch's biggest moments of genuine horror, Delilah's barrage of puns. Especially not with your electric personality. Ugh. Hmm, I see my joke did not spark your sense of humor. Ugh. What, you're not enjoying our current conversation? Oh my god, lady. The, the arc of our budding friendship. How exactly are you in charge? Aw, Henry, that's a good one! If Henry plays along with Delilah here, she'll be shocked thrilled, and it's not hard to see this as a moment the two of them really start to click, their unspoken recognition of a mutual brokenness transforming into a warm and genuine platonic intimacy. Here in Chekhov's mysterious cave, we get Henry's first mention of Julia, I think. I used to go caving with someone back in Colorado. She loved it. Might be great to explore it sometime this summer. Depending on your read of this line, his use of the past tense, loved, can be heartbreaking. Were it not for her disease, Henry might have said, I used to go caving with my wife back in Colorado. She loves it. Coming out of the cave, we see a mysterious figure staring at us from the cliffs above. Henry says he's giving him the creeps. There's some guy out here giving me the creeps. The creeps? Wait, he's looking at you? Is he doing anything else? I, I don't think so. Henry, there's there's something I... something someone should have told you about this area. What is it? It's... outside. Come on. The whole thing. And people come and go as they please. It's... it's... it's madness. The commentary track that's included with Firewatch has more on that detail, and I wanted to play a bit here. If the teens call you a creep, Henry calls the guy who's flag putting a flashlight in his face a creep. Right. And he goes, there's some guy out here creeping, or he says something like, he's a creep out here? She's like, yeah. a creep, Henry? He's like, right. yeah, there's a guy who's spooking me out here. I don't, right. I don't like it. And, I mean, I like doing stuff like that. I pay a lot of attention to sort of the sort of infectiousness of language. Yeah. Uh, and I like, people are like that. People are weird, sort of like passive, like non- participatory sponges sometimes, yeah. and I just like putting that stuff in the writing. And you can do that in games in a way that you can't do that in other media. If you do that in like a book or something, it's so double underlined mm -hmm. that it feels like you're making a big point as an author. But in a game, because it's player driven and it's passive, it just feels causal and the way the world works. I love hearing about the little details like that. And if you loved Firewatch, it's worth another playthrough to go through and listen to the developer commentary. It's incorporated in a really clever way, too, with little playable audio tapes that you can grab from booths at your own pace. I'll be pulling some clips and some footage from my commentary playthrough, so if you see some weird blue boxes with a lamp that you don't recognize, that's what those are. We see our tower site from a new angle as we approach it from the north, including the reveal of the lovable mascot Forrest Burns lurking by the back wall of our outhouse. You know, I don't think there's any fictional character I hate more than Forrest Burns. Henry! 
As an employee of the Forest Service, that is treason. Yeah, well, he really freaked me out as a kid. He inspired me to spend the bulk of my 30s keeping the wilderness safe. A shrink would have a field day with you. Uh, thanks, Mom. What kind of name is Forrest Burns anyway? Well, that would be a pun, Hank. A glorious pun. Again, we're cementing this new bond between Henry and Delilah while making Firewatch's world feel more real. It's a great little detail because our new team is about to be tested by our first big clue that something is up here in the forest. Someone has broken into Henry's tower. Delilah takes it seriously. She's able to switch between the pun-loving Delilah of crosswords and banter to the forestry professional that's been doing this work for over a decade in an instant. Okay, in the morning I'm gonna call my friend Patty who works the desk down in Cody. They keep a list of everyone who's officially been in and out of the trailhead since... I don't know, forever, and see if we can get a list of names. We won't get much, but at least if anything else happens, we can refer to it and see if anything comes up. Thanks. I need you to feel safe out here. If you were analyzing Firewatch as a big mystery story, I think this moment right here is where you could end Act 1, with an inciting incident in the tower break-in and our plot set up for the future. But looking back on it as a story of Henry's emotional journey, ending our first act with the fireside chat of Henry and Delilah feels a bit better to me, though I can definitely understand why people might see this story differently. Day two begins at Henry's desk, Delilah contacting us on the radio and a fresh journal entry next to the typewriter. On my first playthrough of Firewatch years ago, I didn't pay much attention to these because I wasn't really used to those details mattering. I thought I was playing a mystery and that the break-in last night was our inciting incident. Julia was backstory. And I can't fault players for viewing the game through that lens on a first playthrough because that's how years of gaming experiences have primed us to view video game stories. It's not until the end, until we experience the shock of our princess not being in her tower waiting for us, that Firewatch really triple underlines the point it's been making all along, its final act of subversion. We're not a hero. This isn't a big romantic mystery as much as Henry or Delilah might want or need it to be. If you zoom in on his journal entry, it reveals that he's been having what he's referring to as jewel streams. He thought he wouldn't have them out here in the wilderness, but he does. Henry writes, I fell asleep around 5 a.m. There we were, back on the beach in Melbourne. There's that moment where I know it's coming, where I know the water is going to come up and up and up and I think I'm going to spew or my heart is going to stop or something, but this time I woke up before anything happened. Maybe that's progress. It's sad to read. We knew from the prologue how much guilt and responsibility he felt, even if he managed it poorly. Even here, in the woods, literally staring down a new dawn, he can't escape his old darkness. And then Delilah calls him, telling him to wake up. And we'll circle back to dreams and Delilah shortly. One of the more interesting scenes in the game is greatly enhanced if the player is reading Henry's journal entries as they play. We also get more details on the desk division. On the left still is the Wyoming postcard with the slogan, Wild and Free. Delilah's voice literally beckoning Henry on the radio. On the right, it's a mostly full bottle of whiskey, his journal entry about nightmares weighed down by a rock so it doesn't blow away in the breeze coming in through the shattered glass. Then there's the photo still, Julia's face still obscured by the camera. Finally stirred from his reverie, Henry is given another little quest from Delilah to go try to find where their communication wire is cut. We can hear the relief in his voice that he's finally given a problem that he believes he can solve. He's excited as he grabs his bag and sets off into the summer morning. Okay, I can do that. Where is it? On the trek out to investigate the wire, Delilah asks about Henry's life back in Boulder. We can mention our dog, we can mention Julia, or we can mention our favorite bar. In this playthrough, I mention Julia, and Delilah asks for more information before being interrupted by another call. In the shadow of last night's events, overhearing this conversation can seem ominous, another piece in a growing mystery. Or at least I think it's supposed to be, but even in the context of the mystery story, this moment sticks out as an obvious red herring. Does it succeed in making Henry or the player mistrust Delilah? I don't think so. Does it absolutely succeed in furthering this atmosphere of mystery that the player is expecting from a game like this and that Henry so obviously craves to keep his mind off Julia? Absolutely. And speaking of that mystery, we have an aggressively conspicuous trail of beer cans leading right to the cut wire, next to a deflated flotation device looking thing that has the words, go to hell, written on it. Delilah and Henry assume it's the teens, and we're off to the lake to go find them. 
and Delilah teases Henry for talking about clues. Do you see anything from yours, like, you know, like clues as to where they could be? Ah, <laughs> clues. I really like your enthusiasm for mystery. I'm just doing my job. I like it. I, I do. I just, I, I can't wait for you to give these girls a piece of your, our, mind, minds, collective. But no, no clues. I, I can't see anything from here. And just when we've been chided for talking about clues, we stumble across a backpack with ropes and a camera inside that previously belonged to Brian Goodwin, a name that Delilah immediately recognizes. Anyway, yeah, Brian Goodwin. He was stationed in Two Forks, your lookout, with his dad, Ned, three summers ago. Great kid. You can bring children out here? No. You know, I'm not a stickler for rules. They took off halfway through the summer. Why? Where did they go? I don't know. I never really hit it off with old Ned. And, um, one day they were just gone. Sucks. After opening a supply box, Delilah asks about Julia again, since they were interrupted before. I think she'll only bring this up if Henry mentions her on the walk to the cable. In another playthrough where I avoided discussing her, she only came up after the night Henry talks to Delilah in his sleep. What does she have? She's got... Alzheimer's. Like, um, dementia. Whoa. How old was she? Is she? She's alive. She's with her family in Melbourne, Australia. She's 43. <laughs> yeah. What was it like when you guys found out? Devastating. Especially for her. You can understand. And for you. Anyway, everything she worked for was taken away, and that was it. Yeah. I'm sorry to be such a downer. Don't, don't, don't even. I'm happy to listen. Delilah is sympathetic and kind, but the little moment I wanted to draw attention to is this part. Especially for her. You can understand. And for you. Anyway, everything she worked for was taken away, and that was it. Henry completely brushes over how hard this was for him in this conversation here. On this playthrough, my Henry stayed as the primary caregiver instead of putting Julia in a facility. So this was a man who spent years of his life taking care of his wife, his only break being late nights at the bar that left him worse for wear come the morning. I like the detail of Delilah circling back to how difficult this situation is for him as well, and a quick acceptance of Henry's flight when she says, And, you know, we'll try to have some fun this summer. I promise. Hers is an easy empathy and we'll soon come to learn why. I also appreciate that immediately following this conversation about the scariest, most difficult part of Henry and Julia's life, that we walk through a verdant patch of forest revitalized from a recent fire. Adolescent pines shoot up from the ground, flanked by small pink wildflowers. Standing vigil above them all are tall, blackened tree trunks that paid the price for this renewal. And of course, neither Henry nor Delilah stops and says, wow, forest fires can be terrifying and full of suffering in the moment, but look at how resilience is rewarded. See what fruits the new day can bring. What a lovely metaphor for your current situation, and obviously, thank God that they don't. But it's a subtle touch of symbolism if we want it to be, to be appreciated on its own terms or observed and interpreted if you're looking for it. And while we're on the subject of symbolism and Firewatch, I also wanted to sneak in a bit more here. Thoroughfare Trailhead was the name of the trail we used to hike up to our tower, and Delilah's lookout is called Thoroughfare Lookout. A thoroughfare is a road, path, or way forming a route between two places. So yes, it's a logical description for a trail or a tower that's overlooking an area of woodland that's connecting two spots, but it's also an apt description for Henry's broader journey in life, stuck between a past he's ashamed of and a future he's afraid of. The land he's supervising is also called Two Forks, bringing to mind forks in the road, obviously. Many branching pathways, each more daunting than the last. And don't even get me started on the obvious connection to Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood. As we get closer to the girls' campground, Delilah asks what Henry's planning to do after the fire season. Are you going to go be with her? Just go back to Boulder? You should go be with her. That's my opinion. Ah, sorry for the umpteenth time. Anyway, call me when you find the girls. Or anything. Or call me whenever you want. I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about it. Right now, I'm trying to hunt down some vandals, and I don't even know what I'm going to do when I find them. 
I'm not thinking very far ahead. You should go see her. She's with her family in Melbourne. They're not big fans of mine. Oh. Her sister, Susan, is great, but her parents, I, uh, think they always thought she could do better, and that I could have done a better job looking after her. That. I have no doubt you did your best. I don't know. If you want to go visit her, you should go. Don't let a couple of assholes keep you away from someone you love. I'll think about it. It's another nice moment for both of them, Henry being honest about his path and Delilah being generous in her support for Henry. It's a moment I think Henry is probably expected to reciprocate in a few days when Delilah shares what she's running from, but weirdly, he doesn't. When that moment happens, Henry doesn't give Delilah the same absolution. We'll touch on that a bit when we get there. The girls' camp is abandoned, torn to shreds. They left a note on their shredded tent. They think it's Henry's doing. Someone or something has done this, and it wasn't us. The plot thickens. The morning of our third day sees Henry finally repairing his busted window when Delilah starts to ask him questions about his appearance. Henry answers, but when he finds out it's for a drawing Delilah is doing, he seems to have a disproportionately alarmed response. I want to know about your eyes. Get out of here. I'm drawing you. I need to know. You're what? On my first playthrough, I thought it was just awkwardness associated with the more flirtatious nature of their banter, but on a subsequent one, I think it's more because it reminds him of Julia and her drawing, the one that we posed for in the prologue. It's in her journal that we brought up with us. I love the touch of Henry only having three socks hanging up to dry in his tower. Even out here in the wilderness, living in a small wooden glass box barely larger than a Minecraft starter home, one cannot escape one of the only universal truths of our world. Socks are tricksy and false and will do everything in their power to leave you, like a barn cat or a third wife. The days get shorter for both player and Henry. We're now only playing brief snippets for the next few minutes. On day nine, Henry is enjoying a sandwich with a side of sunset when Delilah radios in to tell him that two young girls have gone missing, and they might be the girls we met a week ago down by the lake. We cut to day 15, Henry waking from a dead sleep to Delilah calling him on the radio. We're expecting another clue in the mystery, perhaps our spotting of a shadowy figure outside our tower. Instead, Henry answers, and here's Julia. What do you want? Hey, you big dumb idiot. You're a big dumb idiot. Oh, baby, you sound tired. Hmm. I am. Are you having a nice time? Sure. Are you? Everything good there? Jules? What? Oh, sorry, Henry. Yeah, I'm good. Well, that's good. Well, I'll let you get back to sleep then. <clears throat> okay, Jules. Delilah seems nice. Mm-hmm, sure. Bye, baby. We know from his journal entries that Henry's been haunted by dreams of Julia for a while, dreams where the water is coming up and he's slowly drowning. He's not drowning here. Whether it's due to the passage of time or Delilah's presence is up to our interpretation, but it's a pleasant moment of imagined intimacy between Henry and an articulate Julia. I'm inclined to credit his growing connection with Delilah for his newer, more pleasant Julia dream. It's facilitated through the radio, Henry's literal connection to Delilah, and we've already had a moment of connection between the two women in their drawing of Henry. They seem to have a similar sense of humor too, at least from what we gleaned of Julia in the prologue. Either way, something seems to be healing a little bit inside of Henry. Day 33 starts back near the thoroughfare basin, with Henry checking his map near that small patch of recovering woodlands that we talked about earlier the young life springing up all around him. Delilah checks in with Henry, confessing that he had accidentally called her that night of the dream, and she didn't want to say anything, didn't want to wake him in case he was having a nice dream. It's a lovely little moment between them that can prompt a moment of honesty from Henry. I hope you're doing okay, you know, when it comes to her. I shouldn't be out here. Yes, you should. No, I just ran away from my problems. No, you didn't. Delilah tries to ease Henry's guilt by telling him her story. Oh, uh, look, so 
couple of months before I took this job, I <laughs> I was with this guy, Javier. Oh, he's incredible, caring, sexy as hell. He was a driller down in Casper. We dated for almost five years. I was working with the Wyoming Outdoor Leadership School, and I was obsessed with it. I wanted to be an instructor so badly. And I was sure I was going to marry Javier as soon as I could be bothered. Walls was also a good excuse to get out of town, drink whiskey in the mountains, cut loose. <sighs> then, um... Javier's brother got killed working in Gillette, and for some reason, I didn't come home. Javier said it was fine. He'd go to the funeral, take care of his mom, stuff like that. It'd be easier solo. When he came back, he left me. I came out here. I lied and told my sister he a neighbor. I've just lied about it for over ten years. And, uh... For some reason, I wanted you to know. And this moment is so important for Delilah's character and for their growing friendship, but Henry doesn't respond to it. I could not believe that she's confessing this big moment of cowardice to try to assuage his own guilt and he just lets it hang there. Henry did this on all my playthroughs and it drives me nuts and it's almost unfathomable that such a big reaction or non-reaction is taken completely out of the player's hands. I adore Firewatch and I'll defend many of the elements that others find disappointing, but this moment right here feels out of character for a Henry that's been bonding with Delilah and maturing a bit as a person out here. If Henry is mature enough to realize be that his here. being out here is yes, an act of cowardice and that he should no, be with Julia making some kind problem. of decision about their future, whether no, that's staying or leaving, then he should also be a mature enough person to realize that he needs to respond to Delilah here. Even just saying, oh damn, I guess I don't know what to say, is better than letting it hang in the air only to radio a few seconds later about the supply box. Delilah has a much bigger confession she'll make later in the game, and at that point we do get a Henry that's willing and able to comfort her in the same way she comforts him. It's just striking that he responds with silence here. Oh good. Uh, enjoy. Firewatch takes its biggest time jump now, straight to day 64. Henry opens his door to see a fire roaring in the distance, pumping a dark smoke up into the air that can block out the stars, even from this far away. Delilah and Henry talk about the fire for a bit, and through her slightly slurred words, she offers to let Henry name it. We do, and the conversation takes a small turn after that. The tension that has either been intentionally or accidentally building between Henry and Delilah all summer reaches a bit of a breaking point, and we get this exchange. So there's this creek down the hill, and, um, you know what my favorite thing to do is? What's that? I love to take a bottle of whatever I have on hand, plunge it deep into the water, and let it chill in there all day. And then, on nights like tonight, when it is so disgustingly hot, I have something nice and cool to drink. I learned that from my sister in Santa Fe. She'd do that with a bottle of tequila near her house and make margaritas the size of your head. You'd like it there. I've had one too many bad experiences with tequila. I'm a little reticent to try it again. Well, maybe you just need a new good experience with it. Uh, yeah, maybe. Are you looking at the fire? No, I'm looking at you. Oh. Well, um, let me know when you are. Again, one of the moments in Firewatch where we can't control Henry's dialogue here, so even if you're not looking at her, Henry will say that you are. That and the tone of this conversation means that regardless of your prior choices, Henry really is a little flirtatious here, or at least open about the unlabeled intimacy between the two of them. I don't talk to the other lookouts as much as I talk to you. Not in the same way. I know it's probably been a while since you've connected with someone the way we have. <laughs> I don't mean to get all heavy, but it's been really nice. I wish I was over there. I wish you were too. We could sit outside. We could talk. Without these radios, we could, um... You know... Well, we could just watch this fire. It's gonna burn for a long time. 
There's the option to escalate things, though it's one that I always ignore. Even though Delilah's, you know, is fairly suggestive, Henry's only spoken response of, what could we do, just feels so unsophisticated. It's very ham-fisted flirting, which is in character for him, but makes me cringe too much to ever select. I looked up the scene while writing the script, and I think if you take that option, she says, well, let me tell you, before the game smashes to the Day 76 title card. Because of the implication. And I think this scene serves as the conclusion of our first act, though you could probably also draw this line after the dream conversation or even after the events of day one. This separation felt the most natural to me, but it also leaves us with a lengthy first act and a smaller second one, which tends to be the inverse of how these things normally go. I suppose it doesn't really matter, part of what the best games can do is break out of traditional three-act structure, but it helps in structuring analysis when games appear to fit that mold. So we have our characters, Henry, Delilah, Julia, and the Shadow of the Goodwins. We have a mystery surrounding the break-in in our tower and the disappearance of the girls. And now, true to the game's name, we have a fire to watch. And at the heart of it all, we have Henry's emotional journey as he grapples with his guilt, uncertainty, and obligation, not to mention an increasingly complicated connection to Delilah. Henry's strange summer rolls on. fishing without a license? It's one fish, and I'm sick of all the stuff I got to eat. Our second act opens with Henry setting off to try to catch himself a fish. I really like this beat, and I think it's an important one, despite it being quickly abandoned to further our mystery. We're showing Henry's increasing comfort in the environment. He navigates it easily and for fun now. He's not only adapted to his new way of life, but he's starting to thrive in it. This is also the first day, here on day 76, when Henry starts a day without his wedding ring on. It's been 9 or 10 days since that much more flirtatious conversation with Delilah, and now, for the first time all summer, he's setting off into the world without his ring on. From here on out, he'll start each day with it off, placed on the desk next to his typewriter. His removing it is left up to the player's interpretation. Was this a practical decision or an emotional one? Delilah asks him to look into a problematic bear in the area, and you can hear in their voices just how close these two have become over the course of the summer. Uh, does problem actually mean murderer? Like how Charles Manson is a problem cult leader? Oh, come on. You just have to look for tracks. That's it. Ugh. Can't believe I'm going to leave this planet as a pile of bear shit. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tracking plans are abandoned, however, when Henry discovers a mysterious clipboard down by the lake. Someone left their clipboard out here. Huh. It could have been one of the fish and game folks. See if there's a name or a credential or something. I can call it in. What the... Uh, it's... Holy shit. What's going on? You didn't actually find a bear, did you? Someone has written down what we said to each other, have been saying. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I don't talk to the other lookouts as much as I talk to you, not in the same way. No way. A detail that I like about this clipboard is the snippet about killing Paul McCartney to bring back Jimi Hendrix. The mysterious author, will come to learn as Ned, has transcribed their conversation, but has also added a little annotation. The sad little me three in parentheses is a nice humanizing detail for him. Henry finds a walkie-talkie, picks it up, and then gets knocked unconscious from a blow from behind. He wakes to a panicked Delilah calling him, but with the strange walkie-talkie and the recently discovered clipboard nowhere to be found. All Henry remembers is Wapiti Station, and Delilah points him to a nearby meadow. On the way, we get this very revealing snippet. What's to say that they don't have transcripts from three, four, or five weeks ago? Our entire relationship, friendship, our... Our whole summer. Good catch, Delilah. Someone is out Henry can't get into Wapiti Station without more equipment. So he's off to grab an axe from a nearby firefighter camp. On the way, he and Delilah have a terse exchange when he asks if it's possible someone's intercepting their frequencies. Maybe intercepting our frequency with other radios or something. Henry. It's just a thought. I, I don't even know how you would do that. Yeah, well, you sound worried. No. I'm not, okay? Let's not spin out of control. Just keep hiking. 
Whatever you say, boss. Henry's use of boss here is a stark reversion to the more professional relationship that they had back on day one, showing just how much this new wrinkle has disrupted their dynamic. We also get another reference to the Goodwins, reintroducing them again now that the stakes have been raised in our mystery. I was thinking about the Goodwins. It just struck me that if anything weird like this happened to them, happened to Brian, just how scared he would have been. He had his dad to protect him. Ned, right? Yeah. You don't think he could? No, you're you're probably right. It, it was three years ago. He's in high school now. He's on summer break. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Just Looking back on this moment with what we'll come to find out at the end of the game, that it's Ned Goodwin, the man who failed to protect his son, listening into all of their conversations, makes this moment infinitely sadder. He's guilt-wracked and lonely, and now he's listening to this conversation that probably just twists the knife in his gut. This moment, combined with his increasing anxiety at Henry and Delilah's investigation, makes a slip-up at the end of the day a lot more believable for me. En route to the firefighter camp, Henry will stumble across an old snowmobile with the engine missing. Whoa, someone stripped these snowmobiles down to the bone. Huh. I mean, that's weird, right? I mean, I can come up with a bunch of not weird reasons someone would do that out here, but given what's happened, yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Again, more clues that this conspiracy might be something very different than what they're expecting. Inside the old scout camp, Henry and Delilah have another conversation about Brian Goodwin. Unless it's Brian Goodwin. Well, if forced, I mean, I can make conversation with anyone. Plus, it was sort of fun to hear about all of his nerdy hobbies. I mean, he, he wasn't a scout or a weebelow or whatever? <laughs> I got the sense that boy could barely tie his shoes, let alone a clove hitch. We're getting more characterization of Brian Goodwin, and we're getting it through the lens of Delilah. So we're building him into a symbol of innocence, while also reinforcing his connection with Delilah and Delilah's responsibility for him. Heck no, I'd make a weebelow do it. Henry finds an axe and a very conspicuously placed note that mentions Wapiti Station. If Henry and Delilah weren't curious enough about it before, they definitely are now. And he heads back to his tower for the evening. That's when this happens. Do you see anybody? No, definitely not. All right, so uh, tell me what you think of this. Did you just cough? No. Did you just cough? No. Oh, Um... There isn't any way someone, like, another lookout could be on this line, is there? No. Not without tapping our radios. Get in your tower, shut the door, don't leave, and don't use your radio. So that's how we enter day 77, another moment of raising the stakes. We have confirmation that someone is definitely listening in, and now we have more clues pointing towards what seems like a secret government facility. As scared as Henry and Delilah are starting to get, you can also hear something else in their voice. Excitement. At least some part of them seems to be excited to solve this mystery, Henry especially. He doesn't mention Julia at all on this day. Instead, he's throwing himself into this big conspiracy, looking for clues and coming up with theories. Now, I get it. His response today is a very natural one. He was literally attacked by someone. That's obviously going to get your attention. But I think over the next few days, we see Henry really, really lean into this mystery, right down to the elaborate wall of clues, and I think there's a desperation to how tightly he latches onto it. I always read Henry's enthusiasm for this mystery as part of his emotional escape, and I'll touch on that more when we get to the fallout from Wapiti Station. From the Valley Encounter, we jump ahead to the evening of Day 77, Henry waiting in his tower for Delilah to contact him. Using a code word system, she sends Henry down to grab a new, hopefully untapped radio, and with it, he's off to break into Wapiti Station to investigate. On the way there, Henry and Delilah share their fears, and Delilah admits that if they've been eavesdropping this whole time, then they heard her lie about Henry encountering the girls back at the start of the game. I filed a report that said that neither of us ever talked to or saw those girls, the ones that went missing a few weeks back. It works in this moment to make this conflict more personal for both Henry and Lila, 
But this also is showing Delilah's fallibility. She does this regardless of what we tell her to do. She'll always take the easy way out by lying, and thus always have this little moment of panic when it looks like someone might be able to hold her accountable. It's these little moments that I think give Delilah some much needed three-dimensionality, because without them there might be a little too much manic pixie dream girl energy from her. The quirky woodland princess in her tower that does crosswords, has a pun for everything, and is always eager to listen at whatever Henry has to say. I think most of us have probably met a Delilah in our lives. Someone who wears their vivacity like armor, but my god is this a person whose credit score you're better off not knowing. The game also draws attention to her larger than life personality in our third act, when we find a tape from Ned Goodwin. Winters are harsh as hell and I ran out of books. But I got that antenna rigged up and Delilah, she's a... She's a record you don't gotta flip. Back to Wapiti Station, Henry breaks in as the sun starts to set behind the blackened mountains. He finds some monitoring equipment, a soil grid, and a tent with all kinds of stuff. Henry is rightfully freaking out and thinks that they're tracking his movements as well as their conversations. However, if you look closely at the map, it's easy to see that it's clearly not a route that Henry can take. Thunder Canyon is the most obvious giveaway because the game has made the player basically walk the length of the canyon in two different directions, so we know that we essentially follow it all the way out to the lake. The other lines are also way too direct, jumping over way too much elevation to be plausible paths for Henry. And that's not a nitpick, that's a clue that this isn't what it seems. There's a beat where Henry tells Delilah that he thinks there's an earthquake monitor in the tent. That's certainly what it looks like to me. But Delilah says, You mean like a lie detector? Yeah, I'm not sticking around to get hooked up to it. And the text on her HUD changes from earthquake monitor to lie detector, question mark, the second she says that. Seeing this paranoia shape Henry's reality in real time is really well done. He then sees a barometer and asks why they might have it here. Maybe it's just a diversion. On repeat playthroughs, I wonder if this is supposed to plant a seed in our head. We break into a secret government facility that knows we're coming, by getting through a chain link fence, only to find nobody there and some very generic looking equipment set up in a tent lit only by a single light bulb dangling from the ceiling. Were Henry and Delilah thinking logically, they would come to the conclusion that any facility competent enough to track their movements and record everything they say would also likely be competent enough to avoid detection or at the very least keep people out of their station. But on a first playthrough, this moment is tense, especially since just yesterday Henry was attacked while the player is focusing on clues in the environment. The moment where Henry finds the fake reports is a tense one, and while we'll come to learn that the reports were faked by Ned Goodwin, the panic in Delilah's voice when she finds out Henry's looking at information about her feels significant. Are you shitting me? What? What is it? There's a folder of reports here. What do they say? They're assessments about the two of us. There's stuff in here about Julia. Like what? Stuff I didn't tell you. This is... What, what does it say about me? You said there was one about me. And it looks like they've been following me around. What I do when I'm out hiking? Jesus! Henry, do you hear me? It says that you, you and your boyfriend are still together. What? We're not. They're messing with us. Yeah, uh, okay. Henry hikes back, and just when he's out of reach, someone sets the camp on fire. Um... Delilah, there's smoke coming from the site. Henry and Delilah are panicking now, and Delilah, our horny Virgil, makes plans to get them out of the forest. I will. Back at the tower, Henry is going into full-blown detective mode, taping up clues to his walls and hammering out more questions on his typewriter. It's notable that his typewriter, the tool he's been using to journal to do difficult, deeply unsexy emotional labor, has now been usurped for his fixation on the mystery. The photo with Julia is now face down on his desk for the first time all game. Note his ring is still off on the side of the table too. When we look at Firewatch as Henry's emotional journey, it's these little moments and details we have to pay attention to, because again, if you just treat it as a mystery, it's not going to be very satisfying. But the prologue primed us to think of this as a story of Henry's self-reckoning, and I think it's a crucial part of that story that Henry, like the player, quickly abandons that to focus on the mystery. We want the mystery because we're playing a game, and this is what we're used to. Henry wants the mystery because journaling about his grief and exhaustion and making a decision about his role in Julia's life is scary and hard and aggressively unglamorous. This is a mystery that can be solved. This is a problem that he feels empowered to address. Alzheimer's isn't. He needs this mystery, needs these shadows to be ghosts, because the unreality is a safe space for him.
Henry's new toy is picking up a nearby frequency, and he radios Delilah to tell her, but she's clearly drunk. Hey D, I don't want to harsh your vibe, but maybe, just maybe, that's a bad idea. Henry, Henry, Henry. What? You're harsh in my vibe. My thinking is, I could stay up all night worried I'm going to lose my job because of the side fire, or I could not worry and let the chips fall where they may. It's not like there's any proof we were down there. My thinking is, I'm going to follow this wave receiver. Ooh, I like it when you think. Ay ay ay. I'll just leave you alone with whatever these thoughts are. Last thing I need is another big crossword breakthrough. Seeing Henry ignore Delilah brought me all the way back to that moment in the prologue when Julia comes home late and our Henry is given the option to either ignore her or start a fight. In this playthrough, I picked ignore her, and I wondered if this decision to just ignore Delilah because of an immature decision based on fear and anxiety was connected to that choice we made back in the prologue. It wasn't though. On a second playthrough, my Henry picked a fight with Julia, and then Henry still just ignores Delilah here instead of fighting. So it's not directly related, but there's still an emotional connection because we're seeing the limits of Henry's emotional intelligence. His friend, and maybe more, and fellow target of sinister tracking, is getting drunk because she's scared and worried. And Henry's response to this is to shut his radio off. When literally yesterday, he was attacked and woke to Delilah calling out to him, worried. He now runs off into the night following the beeping on a tracker he just found in a suspicious campsite and not only is this move abandoning his friend, but he's also just demonstrating a shocking lack of common sense. If this wasn't Ned Goodwin, if there really was a big mystery that was worth a giant conspiracy board Henry has in his tower, then this would absolutely be a trap for Henry. He doesn't even tell Delilah he's turning his radio off, he just does it. This is not a Henry that's maturing as fast as he needs to be. Henry finds Ned's getaway pack, including the key to the cave he stumbled through back on day one. Only then does he turn his radio on to talk to Delilah, who sees someone in his tower. Well, it's hard to feel like you have the upper hand when you're standing in the dark in the middle of the woods. Oh. Well, you're back in your tower. Maybe you need a drink, too. God. I am looking at a man standing in your lookout. And it's not you. Our stakes are higher than ever, but they're about to make like the sun made because there's more raisin to be done. Henry rushes back to his now empty tower to find an audio tape stuck to his door. It's a doctored tape of Henry and Delilah's conversation back at the camp, making it sound like it was the two of them that started the fire. The surface level plot has definitely thickened from a hearty soup of paranoia and sabotage to something a little denser and more deliberate, seemingly more ambitious in scope. Baby, you got a stew going. Day 78 starts with Henry desperately replaying the tape from last night, staring through the swirling smoke at Delilah's tower, obscured in the distance. He's clearly anxious, and Delilah is too. She quickly radios Henry that they need to do something. We need to find out what someone's been keeping in that cave. I'm going down there now. We don't have a lot of time left out here, and if we don't find some answers, when they lift us out of here, it's gonna be in handcuffs. And we're off, with our conflict seemingly locked for our third act. Solve the mystery, prove our innocence. I say seemingly because of course this isn't our actual conflict. This is still a story about Henry's emotional journey, and the events following the cave discovery are our actual climax to the game. As we race to the cave, the oppressive grey of the smoke shades the entire landscape, sapping it of colour and life, and we can feel the walls closing in on Henry. This isn't his sanctuary anymore. This isn't his hideout. It's something complicated, something dangerous. In the cave, somebody shuts the door behind Henry, so he's forced to find his way through it. On the way out, he'll look down a massive drop in the cave and see a single high top shoe illuminated by the hazy sunlight. It's a little ominous, even if you don't know what's coming, but it's another clue that this probably isn't the secret cave facility that Henry and Delilah were expecting. Now out of the cave, Henry radios Delilah. I'm gonna hike back to Two Forks and see if I can find anything that could double as an anchor to use in the spot. Well, that doesn't sound dangerous. Delilah, I just found an outcropping that someone was using as a little fort. I think it was Brian Goodwin. 
The objects in Brian's cave continue his characterization as a young, fairly nerdy kid with a creative side. As we talk about him to Delilah, we can hear the affection in her voice as she remembers him. Hey, remember that pack I found? Back on your second day? Yeah. I found a plan Brian drew about how he was going to get it back. Oh, I'm sure it was quite elaborate. It's some wily Coyote stuff, I'll tell you that much. It's a little weird that he just leaves so much of his stuff out here. Well, maybe they were in a hurry when they left. Like I said, he wasn't supposed to be out here. Yeah. I... Uh, they almost got busted. Brian liked to go out on the railing of the tower and wave at the planes that dump water on fires, and... Uh, I got a call because someone thought a kid was up in Two Forks. I lied. And just said it was Ned. If I ratted him out, they would have been forced to leave, and... I don't know, I guess I just felt like I was saving him from whatever shitty life Ned was going to bring him back to. Not that it ended up mattering. Our clues are starting to take a turn in a darker direction. The unsent postcard is the most gut-wrenching one for me, apologizing to a neighbor back home that he can't mow her lawn this summer. There's also the line, Can you write back and tell my dad when school starts? Because I don't think he knows. Delilah also tells Henry that Brian and his dad used to tinker with old radio equipment, more pieces falling into place. And then we find some leftover climbing gear, strong enough to hold when it's driven into the rocks. So, new equipment in hand, Henry returns to the cave to finally get some answers. I wish we spent more of our third act in this cave, though I'm also not sure how we could have. We're also brushing up against the classic allegory of Plato's cave here, but we're essentially inverting it. It is the answers we find inside the cave that dispel the fiction of the real world. Because inside the cave, we find a dead Brian Goodwin. Ah, oh, shit. Are you... Oh, God. You're Brian Goodwin. You fell. Your stuff gave out. Oh, you poor f kid. And that's it. Henry slowly steps over the body and walks out of the cave, presumably wondering how on earth he's going to tell this to Delilah. Hey, D. There you are. I've been worrying my ass off. Hey, I am. Um, I'm sorry, Delilah. I'm so sorry. About what? You're freaking me out. He's in there. What are you saying, Henry? The only thing in the cave is Brian. He's dead. His body is in the cave, Delilah. <sighs> you gotta be f***ing kidding me. How does that... <clears throat> what? I don't... <sighs> How? Climbing, I think, or made to look like a climbing accident. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's just what it was. I mean, he was probably exploring the cave and, and maybe his rope gave out. But whoever locked me in there probably didn't even know about him. I'm sorry, Delilah. I'm so sorry. He'd be alive if I had told someone he was out here. I don't know where he'd be, but I can assure you it would not be rotting at the bottom of that cave. I... There's... there's... there's nothing to say. The hike back. I think we're leaving tomorrow anyway. And there we have it. Henry hasn't figured out the last part of the mystery, but the player likely has. There wasn't a big government conspiracy. It was just a broken, grieving father acting in desperation to keep a dark secret. On day 79, Henry is packing, smoke and ash swirling around outside his tower. The paradise license plate that's been hanging above his door since his first night takes on an additional irony in this newly formed hellscape. Once again, Henry's paradise has become a hell and all he can do is watch. Delilah is still processing Brian's death and they talk about it while Henry packs. I don't have much to say. I'm fine. I'm sad. I'm whatever. I keep thinking about him down there and I just want to get far away from here. What can I do? We just have to wait for the helicopters. Okay. Until then, could you follow that signal? Maybe? Holy crap. Yeah. Uh, oh my god. 
Henry's what can I do after Delilah shares a fraction of her grief is, again, indicative of a boyish desperation, like her grief and guilt is something that he can maybe do something about. We're continuing to build up that emotionally stunted characterization of Henry right up to the end of the game. And then, almost as a mercy, we hear the beeping of the receiver. It's a quest before Henry's evacuation, something that he can do. This is a task that can be addressed immediately through his direct action in a way that grief and trauma cannot. But before we leave, Delilah instructs him to pack up everything he needs. Look, you should pack up everything you need in case we get the call and you can't come back. And that's when we get what I think is the biggest choice in Firewatch. Henry can grab the photograph that's been turned down on his desk and pack it. But I think the most obvious and powerful symbol for this moment is the wedding ring that's been on the desk since the start of day 76. Unlike the other objects in the tower, you can't just pack the ring like you could the photograph. You either leave it there or put it on. No middle ground. I love this bead because of how subtle it is. Like so many of the most important decisions in life, it's just a quiet choice that Henry and the player have to make for themselves with nobody watching and no one to talk to about it. Is Henry going to leave the forest as Julia's husband, ready to go to her and at least make a firm decision about their future? Or is Henry going to leave the ring in the forest and keep her running? And this is a decision that Henry has to make on his own before we get a more direct interpretation of the game's lesson from Delilah later in the day. Henry tracks the beeping to find a tape addressed to him. Playing it reveals that it belongs to Ned Goodwin. He's the one who's been keeping an eye on Henry ever since he saw Henry come out of the cave back on his first day. You guys don't know anything about having kids. All right? Nobody knows nothing. It ain't Andy and Opie walking down the lake to fish every afternoon. It ain't Mayberry. But you gotta know I didn't kill him. All right, we were climbing. I was teaching him. Brian was uneducated in the way to do anything. He just... He just... just f***ing sink his anchor the right way. You know, I thought about going back, having to answer questions, and having to get him put in the ground, and... I didn't see the point. Don't come looking for me. Sorry about your wife. Henry radios Delilah to reveal the truth behind the surveillance operation, but at this point, she doesn't really care. I know I should be relieved. Relieved that there's no evidence of us starting that fire. Relieved that we're not crazy. That there wasn't some conspiracy. But I'm not. He was a sweet kid. With a shitty father who hid out here like a coward after dumping him in a hole. I think, I think that Ned loved him. He still had his photo, you know? I don't want to hear it. He, he obviously didn't want to forget him. He just didn't know what to do. Henry, not knowing what to do isn't okay. When you're supposed to look after someone, you... You figure it out. Yes. Ned Goodwin worked so effectively as a dark mirror for Henry, the man who took the easier, more cowardly path that part of Henry is still tempted to take. To run and to keep running and to do your best to never turn around. But this walk in the canyon makes it crystal clear to Henry what he has to do, that he has to return to Julia lest he turn into another Ned Goodwin. With the helicopters on their way, Henry can ask Delilah to stay and wait for him, and I think most players will. She'll say, I think... Wait, just wait, okay? I'm not that far. Henry, they're here. They're waiting right now. Please. Henry, I don't... I don't want to meet you and just sit here in a dead boy's shadow. Okay, I, I don't want to do that. I know that sounds harsh. <sighs> okay, I'll wait. And it's the lie more than the leaving that ends up feeling like the greater betrayal when we show up to the tower and Delilah isn't there. But we already know that she'll lie to keep things easy when the truth would go down harder. She did it back with the missing girl report and now she's doing it to Henry. On the way up the steps, Henry says, oh, God, it's a nightmare out there. It's the mundanity of this line that amplifies the coming tragedy this feels like the easy intimacy of a couple. This is the kind of thing that Henry would say if he was coming home to her back in Boulder during a winter storm, tapping the snow out of his boots on a cheesy doormat and acknowledging the rough weather as an alternative to a hello. And it's an intimacy that Henry and Delilah have built over their months here, and Henry still doesn't understand why things have changed. 
but they have. Delilah is gone. And if you're looking at Firewatch as a romance mystery story, then this ending could function similarly to the end of Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. I guess spoilers for that book if anyone cares, now's the time to jump ahead a minute. But that novel famously ends with one character refusing to go meet his old lover years later, instead choosing to sit on a bench outside her house while his son goes up to meet her. He says, it's more real to me here than if I went up. It feels like a Byronic choice that seemingly values the idea of love and the martyrdom of longing over the real but often disappointing and messy intimacy of an actual relationship between two imperfect people. But by that point in the story, this character, I, I guess I can say his name, his name is Newland Archer, which I know absolutely sounds like the overpowered protagonist of a derivative YA novel, but I promise that's his name. By that point in The Age of Innocence, Archer had already chosen duty over love years earlier, so one could say that he's earned this unusual choice to hold onto her memory rather than face reality. So again, if we look at Firewatch as a romance mystery game, then I think this ending works, it's just not a happy one for Henry. Of course he wanted to meet Delilah, but after everything that happened, Delilah didn't want to meet us. That's disappointing, and it's supposed to be. She's still reeling from the Brian Goodwin revelation true, but we also know this is a character who abandoned her last serious romantic relationship when things got hard. Confronting the reality of Henry, the man she's only ever spoken to via radio, while also, quote, sitting in a dead boy's shadow, is believably just more than she would want to handle. It's a Delilah that's choosing the romanticized Henry she's built up in her head, rather than the portly, flawed man that comes stumbling up her stairs saying, it's a nightmare out there. And that's a little sad. But like I've said before, while there is a romantic component to the Henry-Delilah relationship, I think Firewatch is much more about metaphorical flight and its actual consequences. We saw that clearly spelled out as Henry and Delilah talk as he evacuates through Thunder Canyon, and I think this final conversation is hammering it home. I don't know what's next. Tell you what, why don't you choose for me, and I'll choose for you. <laughs> All right, sure. Um, maybe... Maybe move to Santa Fe. Open a jade emporium with your sister. Hmm. I'd be trading cute ski bombs for yoga retreat hippies, but maybe that's not all bad. Plus the margarita situation? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what about me? I think you should go to Julia. And then you can figure it out. Maybe put that typewriter to good use. Give me a sexy accent or something if you write about this. I, um... Yeah. You gotta go see her. There's still a tenderness in this conversation, especially from the way it concludes, with Delilah's... Bye, Hank. There is certainly a love here, but it can only ever be this doomed waltz of shallow hearts. I think Henry's choice of where to guide Delilah is significant too, suggesting that she become a crossword editor at the New York Times is a fun suggestion, but it's much too lofty and storybook for the reality to which our Firewatch characters must now return. It's the sort of ending we'd see in an older movie, text going across the screen that says, Delilah went to New York, where through her wit and no small amount of luck, she quickly rose through the ranks to become the New York Times' finest crossword editor in years. And of course, it's not that story. My Henry suggests she go to Santa Fe, live with her sister for a bit, drink some stream-chilled margaritas, and maybe try to give a more normal life another shot. And Delilah, of course, guides Henry back to Julia, though by this point it's clear that he knows he has to return to her. Delilah's leaving before we get there takes away any traditional heroism Henry could have had in a very interesting way, I think. If he had something to lose, if he was the one giving up something real and easy with her to go care for Julia, then he'd at least have a twisted martyrdom to hold on to. Instead, she literally makes the decision for him, both in leaving and then straight up telling him to return to Julia. Through the lens of the video game protagonist, this feels sucky, and that's the point. We beat the game, now we're in the tower, where is our princess? But I think Firewatch makes subverting this mentality the point of the entire game. We're not called to adventure at the start of the game, we're running from obligation. We don't save the land because we literally can't, we just try our best to supervise its orderly destruction. We don't get to run away with Delilah, or even get a big, dramatic moment of closure because Firewatch is ultimately a very mundane story about flawed people. 
and it makes for a jarring and somewhat unsatisfying video game, which again is what I think the point of it is. This is a story that deliberately eschews traditional structure. We don't have a clean start, middle, and end for Henry's emotional journey because that's just not how these things work in life. It seems like he has an epiphany in the canyon on the hike out, like he knows he has to return to Julia and either face her disease with her or separate entirely. Players tracking the ring or the photograph can watch as Henry tries to forget Julia and move on, or, depending on your choices, recommit by donning the ring and taking the photograph as we leave. But again, it's messy. It's not dramatic or definite because it's imitating life. A helicopter arrives to whisk Henry away to safety, and as the credits roll, we see all the photographs we took on our journey before we get back to the ones that Brian Goodwin must have taken. It was Brian's ghost that Ned was running from, now Henry's on his way back to the ordinary world to face his. And so ends Firewatch, and if you couldn't tell already, I think it's a narrative triumph, especially because the ending is so traditionally unsatisfying. If you have a different take on the story or the ending or think I'm missing something, I really would love to hear your thoughts. This game in particular invites discussion like few others. I love Firewatch, and it's one of the rare games that I've played that gets better the more you look at it, at least in my estimation. It's known for its style and dialogue, and rightly so, but the overall narrative, the effortless symbolism, the painful humanity of Henry, Delilah, and Ned, what we're left with is a game that goes out of its way to subvert and disrupt everything we're used to from this medium while still delivering a thoughtful and compelling work of art. It's a game that focuses on powerlessness, obligation, and emotional intimacy in an era where games are more and more about player freedom and empowerment. It's experimental and often messy, but at the end of the day, we're left with a game that I think is doing something bizarre, but powerful. It's absolutely four hours well spent, but if you're anything like me, you'll find yourself spending far more time thinking about it afterwards. A magnificent game that sees the forest for the trees and then burns it all down while we watch. People learn in lots of different ways, but experience is the best teacher. Today, smoking is gonna save lives. 